Um, so next we're going to check the technology again. We're going to listen to, from Gregor Warren from ME Engineering, 15 years experience in the Scottish distillery industry and now based in Sydney. So he's going to give us a pre-recorded presentation when we're ready to go. Thank you. Hello, happy Friday. At least I hope it's Friday and the, the uh, session hasn't been delayed. Uh, I'm Gregor Warren and as you'll, you'll see, I'm here to talk about distillery design. But given that we're, we're talking about it's with WorkSafe today and um, it's going to be very much focused on how distillery, distillery design combines in with um, safety. Um, I don't think those two topics can be separated. Um, they're, they both go hand in hand together. Um, yes, so quickly, sorry I can't be there today. Um, I'm actually currently on a plane flying into Scotland for my first time back in Scotland since I moved out four years ago. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Tasmanian Whiskey and Spirits Association for um, asking me to do this recording and also to WorkSafe Tasmania for setting up these networking sessions. Uh, I think they're very important. The more information and clarity that we can try and get out into these areas, the easier it's going to be for everyone. Right, um, as I said, this, my talk's going to be about distillery design and the safety aspects of that. I'll give a quick introduction to myself and to the company. I'm Gregor Warren. I've worked in the, in the distillation industry, if you like, my whole life. Um, I started out in the, the Scottish distilling. Um, working on projects for 15 years. Uh, that was a variety of projects from energy saving, from health and safety. And then when the distilling industry in Scotland started to grow, it was all expansion projects and new distilleries. That then brought me out to Australia four years ago, and I joined ME Engineering three years ago. My brief largely since I've been out in Australia is to support the distilling industry out here. That was one of the reasons I ended up deciding to join ME M Engineering. You'll notice that I have um, a picture of Steve McHugh there. He's he's the, the other main distilling expert within our business. He worked for Bundaberg Rum and has a lot of expertise on column distillation and on operation of distilleries, um, which ties in nicely with my experience of pot still distillation in the more traditional Scottish manner and, and actually running and implementing projects and new distillery projects. Um, sorry, I just realised I was starting to speak quite quickly there. I'm going to make a conscious effort to try and slow down as I know there is people in the room that will give me grief if I can't be understood. So, yes, um, unfortunately, my accent hasn't completely disappeared yet. Um, so, yes, I'll try and speak slowly to keep myself, to make it easier for everyone there. Right, so that gives a quick introduction to ME. We, ME have been a company that work largely in the food and beverage industries um, and have been since for oh, over 20 years now. Um, we've we work with work across across set, across all, all the different all the different sectors, whether it be soft drinks, beer, and with myself and Steve within the company, we've began to um, put a, a team together that's focused on the distilled spirits production, um, which well, is positive from our point of view. But I think it's also going to be positive for the industry because as the industry grows, they're going to need more engineering support and well. I'm sure everyone in, everyone in the room will be hoping, and I think we, we all believe that the industry is going to grow. So overview, I won't spend any time in this slide. It's basically just I'm going to cover um, about design, designing distilleries um, and how that ties in with risk. <laughs> and my, my, my line in my slide there, it can't just look good, it has to work, because that's sometimes one of my main bugbears. Um, I seem to spend a lot of time it, it's explaining why why certain aspects have to go in that might not make the aesthetics quite as good, but anyway, I'll I'll move on from that. Um, I've had I've had enough uh, enough discussions with architects in my time. Um, this is a, a, just a, a very high level slide, just in how ME would typically run a project. Uh, I don't think that's particularly important for the discussion today, so I'll just move on. The next slide is a. Uh, that this, this is probably familiar to anyone that works in in, in risk, um, and I'm sure there's people in the room that are far more experienced of all the Act regulations, codes of practice, standards, 
than I am. Um, but basically, the, the the key legal requirements are set down in the Act, um, and these these then, if you like, move down to provide more detail. Um, but they're they're not there's there's they're not necessarily legal requirements as you move down. But it's a way to allow you to meet your legal requirements. From my point of view, as a process engineer, I always go back to the risk needs to be managed to a level that is always reasonably practical. And that's that's not a term that's necessarily easy for people to understand, but it's, it basically means that the cost of re reducing the risk, um, it's, it's, if, if it's a practical cost, so for example, if, if you, I'm trying to think of a, a good example, if the cost of having a indirect heating on your still was, say, $5,000 extra, and instead of the cost of putting a direct fire heating in your still, um, but the but the risk the risk reduction could be significant, then you you would have to have a good reason not to do that. And there may be good reasons for not doing that. There might be, um, there might be that might be integral to how you want to make your product. But then you might have to then put other risk reduction measures in that may cost more than the cost of putting in your steam. But that's a that's a that's where you need to do your analysis. It's about how much you. Re it's it's about how to reduce your risk, and then what is practical to do that. And then you have to make decisions within within that within that's how you frame your decisions within within your legal requirements because ultimately your legal requirement is to protect all people involved at your distillery, whether it be you yourself, your operators, or visitors to the site. So you need to you need to think about how you're managing risk to protect everyone that's everyone that's there. Um, yeah, as I said, I'm sure there's people that are that are more more qualified to talk about the, all, all the acts and regulations and how they're implemented in Tasmania. Um, so I'll move on from that one, and I, I suspect Paul might pick up on that as well. Um, so sizing your distillery, again, this isn't quite so um, critical for what we're discussing today, but one of the key issues I, um, I run into working in the industry is people haven't thought about how they're going to expand when they take on their building or when they when they start up, so they end up basically hemming themselves in, which which does tie into safety because it makes it very difficult to expand in a safe manner. Um, so you'll find that that people are squeezing more and more equipment into their distillery, which makes it more difficult to operate, which makes it more different more difficult to put in uh, control measures to reduce the risk. It makes it more difficult to, for example, ventilate your building. So. Always think about when you're very. If this is when you're starting out of the space you're going to need, and think about all aspects of all the equipment you're going to need. It's not just a. It's not just a still. Um, you're going to need your cooling, your boiler, um, all those aspects. So think about your sizing. There's lots. Of, I mean, it's all about ultimately. It's all about how many bottles you think you're going to sell, and how and now how many bottles you think you're going to sell in five years. And there's there's lots of it. I mean, it's a whole. That's a whole different area of marketing. But that's from from me as a process engineer, understanding where you want to start and the volumes you want to get to is important for for advising you and what equipment to use from the start. Um, Yes, site selection I just touched upon there, but site selection is very important for the distillery and for trying to make your distillery safe. It's I would always say it's important to have some sort of outside space as a distillery, just because you're going to have sort of cooling equipment. Um, and the more, the more it also helps you if you've got outside space, then you've got areas that you can vent your stills and your tanks externally, which again reduces your risk. So having external walls and having outside space is going to be a good thing if you're but this again this is if you're picking a picking a new site for your distillery. Because what, what you'll find if um, is having adjoining walls becomes problematic because um, of fire regulations and how you protect the adjoining buildings that can become quickly quite difficult and quite expensive to manage the risk to an appropriate level. Layout design. I've, I've touched on this before, but it's one of the it's one of the biggest challenges in distillery design. So, 
cost is always a driving factor to reduce floor area, but also, as I was saying, think about the expansion and also think about how you position equipment and how you lay it out to allow safe operation, to allow the, the other aspects. So, so, for example, running vents to the outside, putting in appropriate ventilation, installing bonding, all those aspects, depending on, on how you've laid out your equipment, can be can be made much easier if thought about from the start, become much more difficult to retro re, to fit retrospectively. Um, as I've got in the slide there, adding these at a later date is difficult and costly. One one thing I'll just pick up on is there that I mentioned is it, trying to keep your process operations and your cash storage in ideally completely separate buildings is something I would always recommend because your 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 cast storage, um, you're unlikely to get a source of ignition in that area. You're just storing cast as long as you're, you've, you've got your lighting, appropriate lighting, and you've got a good methodology for handling your cast. You don't have so much, so many operations going on that can, that can lead to, to ignition starting. Most, for example, most cast fires are, are have been, most cast warehouse fires have been started by lightning. Um, however, if you've got your process operations, there's a lot more moving parts. There's a lot more things that, that can potentially cause sources of ignition. So from a, from a safety point of view, it's always best to separate this. But also from a business risk point of view as well, because obviously you've got a lot of um, value in those casts as well. So that's something, if at all possible, um, to think about separating out your process operations from your actual cast storage. Um, Still heating. I won't. I won't spend too much time in this because this is it's more a process thing. But there there is different risk profiles um, depending on what type of still heating you choose. Um, direct fired is obviously one of the highest risk options because you've got a flame. There are ways to design them safely. I know there's been new new ones put in recently in Scotland, but I know that they were very costly to put in appropriate control measures to manage the risk accordingly. So that's something that should be considered bef um, before considering going ahead with that option, that you, you will have to put in extra control measures to manage the risk. Uh, Electric is the next option, which again is good, is typically used for very small stills. But it's, that's probably one of the biggest, there's, there's a lot of stills that don't have appropriately IEC, AX rated and certified electrical elements. And that's something that needs to be specified right from the start to ensure you get the correct, the correct item. So again, it can, it can be tricky to get that right. And um, so it's, it's, it's worth being aware of that from the site. Again, I would always recommend, if at all possible, to try and use steam, even if you're using an electric boiler to produce your steam and running the steam in. It's just an inherently safer option. Um, and then I talk about the different efficiencies of the steam options. I don't think that's so relevant for today, um, but basically how you heat your still, the, the, way, the recommended way of doing it will change with the scale of the distillery. Uh, still venting. So still venting is something that's, very important because well, I've put in that photo just to just to give you an idea of why it's important. There was a, that's from a distillery in America that actually blew up because their still was not appropriately vented. They had they had bought a still that had um, that had a pressure rating. The, the the still designer put a pressure relief valve on it that was far too high. I think the, the pressure release valve was set at something like two bar, which is way beyond what the still could actually uh, actually take. So what happened is the pressure built up in the still, the relief valve didn't relief, and it led to led to an explosion. And I, I think there was actually someone killed from that incident. It, it was very, either very severely severely hurt, but I think he actually ended up he ended up passing away from that incident. Um, so yeah, so there's. There's a for still venting. There's two cases you have to consider. There's normal with filling and emptying, and ideally you would have a valve that's interlocked, so you so that when you're when you're filling your still, you have a valve that allows the still to breathe to ideally to a uh, to outside, so that any vapors that come out of your still are displaced displaced outside the building. Um, the second aspect is overpressure vacuum. Um, because as I said, that kind of serious consequences. There's very simple ways of doing it, just with a, a water a water 
pot seal um, that would blow out the water if it over pressurizes and draw in the water if it under pressurizes. So there's there's relatively cost effective ways of ensuring you have um, over pressure and vacuum protection on your still. But again, it's something to be aware of. One just uh, for one of the biggest causes of um, sort of over pressure or still failure is cooling water failure. So it's always important to have a control methodology for how you're ensuring that your cooling water is running when you're running your when you're running your still. So whether it be just a flow switch or how, however however it's done, that's one of the most important control measures you can have. Once you get to once you become a big once you're work, once you're a bigger distillery, there's more causes for overpressurization and vacuum because you you'll probably have a CIP system which can which can cause overpressurizations and vacuum conditions as well. So there there, there are there are more things to consider, but um, yeah, cooling water failure is always one I highlight because that's a that's a important risk reduction measure at all sizes of distilleries. Heat recovery. This, this again, this isn't so relevant to what we're trying to discuss today. So I'll, I'll quickly move on. But there's 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 ways you can make your distillery more efficient. And um, typically, these become better, more valuable at scale. Um, but that's that. I don't think that's important for our talk today. These aren't related particularly to safety. Um, Spirit storage is is something that needs to be considered. So this is one that um, I spend a lot of time talking to people about. There are lots of different ways to do storage, and there is a particular standard for spirit storage, which is AS1692. There, it specifically doesn't mention, it specifically doesn't cover processing tanks. So, for example, your day tanks that you use, that come typically with your still for storing the spirit you're processing that day aren't covered by AS1692, but anything you then transfer into it is covered by AS1692. At the small end, you, you'll typically use IBCs, which is allowed, but it should be noted that particularly with plastic IBCs, they have to be appropriately related for flammable liquids, and they need to be... Um, they would have the cage and be able to be earth, and you would have earthing points as well. I, I would typically recommend, if you can, to use stainless steel IBCs um, when you're when you're working with spirits. Um, it's just inherently a bit safer. But again, you have to always make sure you're earthed before you're doing the operations. But if you're putting in anything, any permanent tank to store your spirits, then you have to make sure it's appropriately designed, which largely comes down to um, thicknesses and how there, there's there's basically a standard there. But one of the main things is, yeah, thicknesses, pressure rating, and fire safe valves and outlets are the three that I highlighted in the presentation. But there, there is a bit more to the actual, the actual design. But you can put that into your specification when you're buying a tank to the tank supplier, and they should be able to refer to the Australian standard. And basically, from AS 1940, it's really when you get into any sort of decent size, it, well, really any sport, spirit storage, they push you to have it outside. You can, it's, um, again, this is when you're moving up the scale, but really AS 1940 is written in such a way that spirit storage should be outside wherever possible. Um Cooling systems, again, this isn't so much safety related. This was more uh, that there's ways to actually cut down running costs. So again, yeah, this was, uh, this was more, I suppose, one that was selling the, the sort of work we do, that engineering can actually save money. Sometimes we get we people look at um, engineering and the cost they have to pay and see it as a as a um, just an extra outgoing with no benefit, but actually designing and engineering your plant properly will save you money in the long run, um, which is what this slide was trying to suggest. But I don't think that's the purpose of today's talk, so I'm going to move on from that one. Um, yes, choosing your equipment is, I mean, this is a, it, it's very easy to just go out to a supplier from wherever you're, you're going out to the supplier and saying, I want a still to be a, 2,000 litre still or 1,000 litre still or whatever it is. But there's a, actually a lot of design in that and not all the still suppliers are necessarily doing process design or or 
understand the safety implications. So you've got to be very careful when ordering equipment, particularly when you're using it to um, store or produce flammable liquids. So I've just put in a few, you, you've got to consider sizing, materials, how it's going to operate. Um, there's all sorts of aspects when you're trying to specify equipment that you need to get right. I've worked through this at the at all different scales, um, and it's actually harder at the smaller scale. You have to spend a lot more time with the smaller end suppliers, trying to trying to ensure that they get it right. Whereas the larger suppliers are are more up to up to speed with what are the requirements. Um, but even so, even when specified, you, there's still a lot of work in ensuring your, your, the equipment you get is actually fit for purpose. Um, hazard area classification. So this is, this is one that um, causes a lot of confusion within the industry, and that's for a variety of reasons. So one of the notes I've put in here is minimising hazard areas will save money, but that's not minimising hazard areas. Saving money isn't your prime concern, but that is a, one thing that will come out of it because by by reducing your hazard areas, you're reducing your risk. You're reducing your chance of flammable. Basically, hazard, a hazardous area classification is basically identifying where your hazardous areas can occur. So, it's a very rough rule of thumb. A zone zero would be hazardous area would occur all the time. A zone one, it would be expected to occur during normal operation, and a zone two, it would be expected to occur during abnormal operations. Um, when I worked in the UK, um, zone ones should be avoided wherever possible. Um, so, you should be trying to avoid having has um, flammable vapours existing in normal operation. Sometimes you have small areas where they can't be avoided at sample points and things like that, where you would expect a small flammable flammable uh, atmosphere to occur in normal operation, and that, that can be allowed for in hazardous area classification. What you should be trying to avoid is large zone one areas. So that would be, for example, venting. Venting a tank that you're filling at quite a fast rate inside would give you a large um, flamm potential flammable vapor, and that can be that should be avoided by venting it outside where you've got where it would vent into the open air and away from potential sources of ignition. Um, so yeah, so trying to minimise this is just an example of one where where I did the original where we did the original hazard area classification, and I had large areas of zone one, but by making some. Um, Modifications with where they vented and where the how the ventilation would operate, they managed to reduce the zone rating significantly, which not only made it made it safer, but it actually saved money on the electrical installation. And I've touched on quite a lot of the things that you do to achieve this before: is you vent out, you vent your vapors outside, you bond to contain spirit re releases, don't open man doors during filling, and make sure your ventilation is suitable and would prevent vapor build up. And also consider extracting a cast filling. Um, that's one that um, was becoming more and more prevalent in the Scottish industry when I left. But obviously, the scale there is much greater. But that can create flammable vapours when you're filling a cask as well. Um, yeah, and that's just to show that was with minimal control measures, and that was with basically more control measures, as as I mentioned, yeah, the zone really um, adjusts significantly. Electrical equipment and hazardous areas. This is another area that causes a lot of confusion and a lot of problems. Um, I'm not going to be claimed to be an electrical engineer, but what I can say is the only way that you can get a, a qualified hazardous area electrical designer to sign off on your plan is if you've bought appropriate IECEX rated equipment. However, it's, it is quite a complicated field and it's also there's, you're also meant to be appropriately qualified to design it and select the equipment. Um, so I would always recommend getting an electrical designer who's trained. And you basically, like, when I'll, I'll come to how you check if someone's qualified or not. But yeah, having you need so your there's three aspects to this. You need to have someone that's appropriately trained to do your hazardous area cost um, classification. You need to have somebody that's in appropriately trained to do your electrical design, which is basically selecting the equipment and how it's going to be wired. And then you need to have someone that's appropriately trained that actually does the installation. So it's it's quite a it can be quite a um, onerous part of your installation, which is why 
I try and recommend to avoid putting any electrical equipment into your hazardous area if it can be avoided. Um, particularly electrical heating elements are difficult to be to make safe. But instrumentation can, can be more straightforward because it can either be simple apparatus or it can be intrinsically safe. But again, it all has to be specified correctly. If the one thing to take out of this is the equipment has to be IECEX rated. If you buy ATEX equipment, it's very difficult to get an electrical designer to, to sign off on it because it does not meet the requirements for, for Australian standards for AS3000. Um, it's yeah, it can cause a lot of problems because people are trying to do the right thing and buy and ask for EX rated equipment, but it really needs to be IEC EX certified equipment that's asked for. Otherwise, it can just it's yeah, it causes more hassle than it's worth, and that's something if it can be captured early, it can usually be done because most equipment is um, there's usually a replacement or it's dual certified. But yeah, to ask for that at the start makes a huge difference. Do you need consultants? Yes. I mean, I, I'm sure you're listening to me and, should, and say I would say that. Um, but my, 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 my argument to that is there's no way you can be co competent in all aspects required to build a distillery. There's usually a, a whole team of people involved. Um, obviously, at the, at, at there's that varies between the larger end and the small end, but there's still... There's still critical points where you're going to need professional engineers, whether it be architects, fire engineers, dangerous goods, I would say, but most importantly, process engineers, um, electrical engineers, there's, there's a, a whole there's a whole host of people and that can provide expertise into helping you making sure that you build your distillery correctly and going with what we're trying to achieve today, build your, build your distillery safely. Um, and I, I often get asked, how do you decide? Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of there's a lot of people that give information and there's contra contradictory information out there as well, um, on particularly on hazardous area classification. So how do you decide who's competent to give you the information or not? And I, I would always be saying, ask for the qualifications. Anyone that's doing, that's doing this work either has to prove their competency to you. They can either do this by... Um, they, oh, but by far the most straightforward, and this is the way I would trust more than any, is they would have their they would have done a, a qualification. So I've just put my qualification there for doing hazardous area classification, um, to give you an idea of what it looks like. There is allowance in the regulations for if you have suitable experience, but I would say that's harder to define exactly what that is. I mean, there will be people that have suitable experience but don't have this particular qualification that I'm sure would be capable. But I would always be asking to show the qualifications of why why they're competent to do what you're asking them to do prior to engagement. Um, so yeah, that's just just one that's become that does does become an issue of advice being given in the industry by by people that aren't properly trained to give the advice. Um, that's just contact details, so how you contact me. Um, I obviously won't be available for the next few weeks as I'll be in Scotland. But yeah, one of the one of the unfortunate things about me not being there with you today is one of the one of the things I think the best parts about these these sort of um, networking sessions is the actual networking and be able to ask questions. So I, I know that Paul will will be doing the talk and will be able to answer a, answer a lot of the questions. He, um, but I'll I'll also make sure I'm over again um, if if you'll have me back. Um, and I'm quite happy to to chat about the the aspects of designing a distillery and 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 trying to basically get as much information as I can out there of. Of the of the main things that you need to consider for designing a distillery and designing a distillery safely. Well, that's if the TWSA will have me back. Um, but yes, well, um, I, the, TW, the TWSA are doing great work in this area. I think um, what they're working towards is exactly what the industry needs. Um, it's obviously going to take a bit of effort, um, but all the all the work that has been done is very positive. I think it's going to help everyone because I think the clearer safety becomes, the easier it's going to become for everyone to implement. Um, and it's just going to lead to us all having a much better and safer industry. 
Yeah. Um, so, yep, yeah, I'll look forward to meeting you all in person at the next opportunity we have. I hope the rest, le rest of the networking session goes well. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Cheers. Bye.